Books on the Brain. <laughs> Welcome back to Books on the Brain, a podcast of books and nonsense. I'm Deirdre. And I'm Danielle. And this episode is coming to you after we've taken <laughs> our break. Well, well rested. Well, Not now, but we'll be well rested then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. If you are following us on Instagram, then you may have seen the post where we announced the break that we were taking. We didn't really, Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't necessarily a premeditated break, but it just kind of ended up working out that we needed to take it. So we did. Yeah. 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 Um, I think just how, how the cards were unfolding, it's a busy time of year for a lot of people, which is weird. Like, it's end of semester for me, start of summer school. Uh, and for you, it's like turnover of cast. All this stuff is happening. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just like the universe was like, this is the time that you get to not, you get to, st- you need to sleep. You need sleep <laughs> you need, and you need to take a break. But how are you, how are you doing today, Danielle? Um, today I'm good. Uh, I just finished doing a week of PT day camps. So me with kids for eight hours a day, um, which sounds like the normal thing, but it's just me with the kids. <laughs> I don't get preps. I don't get breaks. I don't get a lunch. Uh, so it's just me hanging out with a bunch of cool kids. Um, it was a lot of fun. The kids this week were really sweet. Um, they made plays literally every day and they're like, we don't want your help. So I just sat and watched oh. them make plays. Cute. And I was like, okay, kind of stay. Uh, they were like, we want to show you. And I was like, oh my God, okay. Do the plays make sense? No. But they had fun. And I was do, like, I'll do they it. need to make sense? Um, No, but I did realize how little since they made because a parent came early today. And it was like, he was like this. And like, I got it because I was like, oh, it's like, they're getting magic powers. And the dad was like, <laughs> what? And I was like, oh, no. It didn't really make sense, did it? Uh, whoopsie. Um, but we all speak a language that the the, the, the others just don't get. They don't get. Uh, but yeah. other than that, I'm good. Next week is my last three classes of my PS2. And then I do my summer courses. And then I do my PS3 in the fall. And then I'm a freaking teacher, which is crazy. Yay! Crazy. That's exciting. You're frozen or you're very disinterested. <laughs> Oh no! Oh, you oh, me. you're frozen too. You're just so frozen. Can you hear oh, me? No. <laughs> oh no! Now you're not frozen. <laughs> I re- I can hear you now. Okay. Can, am I can moving? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're moving. Not anymore. Yikes. Hey, you, you're frozen. Oh my god! Are gosh, you sure? This is funny. I wonder what the U- I wonder what the YouTube video is gonna look like. <laughs> it's it's probably gonna be it's probably gonna be my end, uh, or you're just gonna get one. This is funny. It's probably recording my end. Oh no! I'm which which was I'm me some being good really excited for you position here, <laughs> and then you being like you look so disinterested, and I was like I hope not, because I was pretty excited for you. it literally was you frozen like this and i was like i didn't catch it for a second i was like oh is this shocking i was like oh no that was very funny um what a beautiful beautiful classic little zoom moment uh but yes i'm done in i'll graduate in december which is crazy 2023 which was my secret goal because 23 is one of my favorite numbers um and yes it's an illness but (laughs) gosh darn it i wasn't going to graduate in 2024 so it is what it is (laughs) it's to be what it is how about you how are you right this instant you just got back from a trip uh three weeks ago (laughs) i know but for me who hasn't gone on a trip in years you just got back on. i know it actually feels like i just got back yeah so i went to disney world in florida for a weekend at the end of march which was so fabulous um i went with my three best friends from high school Mm. and we had a blast we stayed at the newest resort riviera um and we ate at some great restaurants we rode all the rides 
all of them. The only one we didn't get to ride was uh the Ratatouille ride because it oh. kept breaking down. And there's we don't know what it is about the technology of this ride, but assuming because it is trackless and there's a lot of like multi-sensory stuff that happens on that ride it takes an hour for the ride to reboot so if there's already like an hour wait on the line plus it's going to take an hour to reboot you're looking at like a two hour wait to get on this ride um so it just didn't end up working out that we could ride it but we got to ride everything else i got to ride tron early because it was in a soft Ooh. opening. Um, I'm and? trying not to talk about it like oh. <laughs> spoilery. Don't tell me. I guess, okay, I'm going to say, if you don't want spoilers for the Tron ride in Disney World, yeah. Florida, skip the next 30 seconds of the okay. podcast. <laughs> um, the ride is very cool. Uh, we ended up paying for Genie Plus plus individual lightning lanes because of the way the tickets worked out. And yeah, it is such an interesting ride because you're like on a motorcycle. Yeah. Um, and there's like you can either like really hug the um vehicle or you can like prop yourself up, which is kind of cool. Like like it is safe to ride it in two different positions which is really fun Ooh. um I also really like that they've built in an accessibility component where like if you don't fit in the ride like if it doesn't close properly they have yeah. an alternative vehicle that's like a cart oh, amazing that they just pull that's out awesome. and attach so for like handicapped people or for riders that are fat um yep. and we got to watch that in action there was a guy that tried to get on ahead of us and he was just um too big for the ride uh yeah nothing wrong with that just no. you know that's the way the vehicle was is. made um yep. and so they just said you know like whoever's gonna ride with you step off to the side and when we pull the next round up we'll attach the alternative vehicle which was super cool um and then i will say this is definitely longer than 30 seconds sorry guys we're that's still okay. in the tron moment <laughs> still done with tron um <laughs> It is like, it feels like it's 40 seconds long, which is not long enough for a ride, in my opinion, especially a ride. We like technically paid like 25 ish dollars to ride individually, like on top of our park passes. Um, wow. We like paid money to ride well, this you ride wanted specifically. To guarantee you could see it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I wouldn't say it's necessarily worth that, but they built the queue that that is how some people are going to have to ride it is to like pay to ride it and which is crazy to me yeah it's already so expensive <laughs> exactly and then we were going on other rides that have been in the park like since they opened and I was like these are more exciting than this brand new ride that I've been waiting since they announced because I knew it was coming from Shanghai and mm -hmm. I'd been so excited for it to come and I was like oh kind of a letdown it just um, looks so freaking cool. It is it is a really cool ride. I think there were just it could have been like 20 to 30 seconds longer and yeah. had a couple more elements thrown into it. But that's my two cents. But my favorite ride I rode was the Guardians of the Galaxy ride. That thing was freaking cool. I messaged Deirdre and I was like, what was your favorite ride? What was your favorite thing to eat? I just dropped my iPad on the ground because I yeah. haven't dropped it. Um because yeah, that is Guardians. my favorite thing about that is my favorite thing about Disney is like the food and the rides are cool. yeah. I did get so many people in my DMs on Instagram were like, "How is Rise of the Resistance not your favorite?" And I was like, "Because it's not a ride; it's like a whole ass experience." Yeah, it's that's the the Star Wars thing. I did yeah. it in Disneyland, and then we did it again here in Disney World, and it is unlike anything I've ever done. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is a whole, like, if you think going to Disney World is an experience, like, walking into Animal Kingdom is, like, an immersive experience. Walking into Magic Kingdom is an immersive experience. Doing, like, dinings and, like, meeting characters. Like, all of those are experiences you can have at Disney. Star Wars Land and Rise of the Resistance are on a whole other level inside yeah. of this fantasy world that you get to go on vacation to. It's so. So cool. Um, 
So yes, I went on vacation for the first time in three years and it was fabulous. Um, and now I am like a ball of anxiety because my mm-hmm. thesis approval or not is happening on Monday. And Woo! I'm like, by the time this episode comes out, we're going to know if I'm graduating at the end of May, which is really exciting. That is super exciting. I, uh, How- but I can literally, I feel every day my anxiety g- going like higher and higher and higher. And I keep having to distract myself because I'm just yeah. like, I I don't even know if I'm going to know on Monday night. I It might be like Tuesday or Wednesday before I find out. Yeah. Yep. 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 That's so exciting though. Holy yeah. smokes. Will everyone send retroactive uh, good luck, Deirdre's way, please? Thanks. Um, it'll work. We know it. <laughs> it'll work. It'll work. <laughs> um, holy smokes. Well, here we are. Phew. And tonight's the finale of season 15 of RuPaul's Drug Race. Yes. I didn't get to watch the um, reunion. It's pretty good. <laughs> It wasn't it wasn't uploading to the MTV app. Oh. And I don't know if it was just like that it was taking a while or it's not uploading, but I haven't been able to watch it yet. I'm pretty upset about it. Weird. But I have finished Love is Blind. I have not. My mom called me today about it. She was like, You need to watch it. And I was like, the last season already left. I I'm I'm devastated. Like this show is devastating it's like losing you lose things by watching this show i don't Um, know (laughs) i live for the drama (laughs) i i know but part of me is like i think i lose faith in authentic relationships every time i watch it um there's it's just like people suck (laughs) yeah i'm really interested because the reunion's on sunday and it's going to be live so i'm very interested to see what that brings a live reunion a live reunion (gasps) obviously i can't watch it uh i'll probably watch it i'll probably watch it on monday but But even the fact that they're doing it live is very interesting isn't super fun um but i also watched perfect match which I think you should watch. I started Perfect Match and then they were (laughs) they were fighting a little too much for me. Gives me a little bit of my PTSD flare ups when people fight like that. I was like, they're all yelling at each other. I was like, this is supposed to be escapism and they're not really escaping anything. Mm -mm. Um, It was just pure drama chaos and I was like, yes, this is what I want to watch right now. And I think when I'm like a little bit like out of fight or flight semester I can watch that mm. when I'm in fight and flight semester it makes me more anxious so I'm like fair <laughs> but I do like it and I do like love is wine so I'm gonna get to it it'll be on my list for the summer okay so I can't talk to you about it it's fine you and my mom could t- <laughs> you wanted to you want to call my mom you guys can talk <laughs> That's she said okay. the same she quite literally said the same thing to me today. She was like, well, who am I supposed to talk to about it? I'm like, well, not me. Maria. Deirdre. Deirdre. You can call Deirdre if you want. I've, I've been talking about it with my coworkers. I'm waiting for one of them to finish uh, today's episode. Well, there you go. There you go. All right, my dude, what are we doing here today? We are back with a tried and true, everybody's favorite book report. <laughs> Woohoo! And our mascot, and little walnut. Um, I didn't. Oh my god! Can I give? Can I have a quick uh, uh, sideline story, please? Yeah. I didn't send you this photo, uh-huh. but I put it on my my like personal. Oh my god, that was my own fault. Um, I I, I started looking at started looking at more cats. Yeah. Not because I'm like, but I might. I don't know. Yeah. It's one yep. of those things. Yeah. Uh, and I found an orange cat, which was the kind of cat I wanted to get next. And guess what the freaking cat's name was? Peanut. It was not Peanut, but in close. <laughs> it was Peanut. I would have texted you. Oh, Hazelnut. God, Cashew. <laughs> Cashew. And and a good like, solid nut. I was like, do I get this? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yes. And I was like, yeah. I just... I didn't obviously cashew's not mine but it's okay. if anyone sees any orange 
nut named cats, you can send them my way. Nut named cats. Nut named cats. There's there's out. plenty. Pine, hazelnut, peanut, yep. cashew, cherry. <laughs> sure, pecan. <laughs> Yeah, we're on two very different wavelengths today. Cool, 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 cool. Good, 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 good. Good, good, good. Bodes well, um, bodes well. So, who wants to go first? I kind of want to go second. <gasps> Mine's a fun okay. one. Oh my god, yes. Okay, and I we can end first. on like a fun note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Okay, cool. Mine has a little bit of a caveat beginning to it, but... Okay. Recently, I went on a road trip. <laughs> a six-hour road trip to Red Deer, Alberta. Okay. <laughs> Which if you're wondering where is that, I say, yeah, exactly. Uh so it's north of Calgary, about an hour. So it's like it's between Calgary and Edmonton. So it's it's quite north uh from where I live, which is like basically the US. Um and we were driving there because my friend wrote a play and we we're doing a stage reading of it. And I directed the stage reading. So we were going to get feedback on a stage reading. Uh which was part of a theater company that my friend is the artistic director of. It was like a well-connected, this thing worked out. Um, this play was super cool. And I was like, yeah, I absolutely want to be involved. But we had to drive. <laughs> and we had to drive in a day. So my butt's up at 6 a.m. Getting my friends in my little car. <laughs> getting my little gas. And we're going. Um, and so I have my friend, who's the playwright. Her name is Jess in the front seat. And then my my friend, Alex, who's in the back seat, who was coming as moral support uh and so we're driving and obviously we're talking 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 and I look behind me and Alex is like conked out snoozing uh so then me and Jess obviously started talking about horror <laughs> because what else do we talk about on long horror uh road trips other than the genre of horror right uh and we both love horror but like very different horror like I'm talking to her about horror books that I've read so obviously we, we, we got on topic of cult so I talk about Taryn Fisher <laughs> and I talk about the honest truth and I'm like I gotta tell you about this book, or The Honest Lie, whatever it's called. So then I'm telling her in depth about this book. I'm like, I don't like this author. Like, I'm ripping it apart. And then she brings up this episode of The X Files, where she tells me an in depth, like, thing of this ep- X Files episode. Yep. Uh, whatever, whatever. And then she brings up this thing called analog horror, which I'd never heard of. Mm-hmm. And analog horror is like this new branch of horror that has been born out of the bowels of the internet which is so freaking cool because it's like the first new thing that's come from the horror genre in a really long time because like horror used to be in books and then it got into movies like and like radio plays and all these things Mm -hmm. but basically analog horror are these horror series that are that come from these like it's a playlist of videos that people will make that you can watch in any order there's like specific orders that you're supposed to watch it Mm -hmm. and it doesn't uh have a clear narrative line it just gives you hints and clues that you figure out what is going on through watching mm-hmm. all these videos and I was like oh that sounds so exciting I would love to like that sounds like totally my cup of tea I go home watch one thing terrified cannot watch it scariest thing I've ever seen mm-hmm. um and I was like oh no <laughs> like it's basically like the aesthetic of old VHS like home videos like you would watch when they would wheel the TV into your classroom uh-huh. and then put it in and it, like Bill Nye-esque, like mm-hmm. just music and images. Yeah. Um, And it's all about these uncanny things. So it's like, some of them are about doppelgangers or like other creatures, aliens, things coming and inhabiting humans um, or like inhabiting religious figures, which was the scariest one. That was like- mm. <laughs> <laughs> this is so scary um or like these creatures kind of thing and mm-hmm. so then she got, starts talking about Lovecraft and Lovecraftian horror which I know very little about but I was like whoa Lovecraft is an author so I could do that sort of book before uh so basically I'm talking about H.P. Lovecraft today and why we continue to use this stuff even though he was a horrible racist mm. And how H.G. Lovecraft is quite literally an, like, Lovecraftian horror is in everything. Wow. Even things that you don't think is in, it right. is in. And I'm like, why do we continue to use it? It's super interesting. Um, Anyway, if you want some good analog horror recommendations, the Gemini Home Entertainment 
scary <laughs> scary <laughs> uh there's also another one i don't know if you just google analog horror they're scary as hell um i won't be doing that but i hope some of our listeners i know, I know. Will. <laughs> I know your face during the whole thing was like i absolutely will never do that and i was like fair uh my friend said if you have a hard time with a grasp on reality do not watch this and I was like I'm probably fine and I was like I'm not fine <laughs> I'm not fine my grasp on reality is not strong enough for me to watch these uh no, but no. basically uh Lovecraft I'll talk a little bit about him and then what his idea of horror was because for okay. me I'm like of course like I knew like everyone knows about H.P. Lovecraft I think okay but for me like his his um canon is so big that I was like hey, what actually mm. did he do right um and it's really interesting what he did so I'm excited to talk about it so he <laughs> basically was not famous within his own lifetime he got fame after he passed away which okay. classic um he he was an author born in 1890 in Providence oh, wow. and he grew up um with basically both sorry now I'm gonna have an allergic reaction to my cats nice he both he grew up with both of his parents passing away of mental illness in like an insane asylum wow having like psychological breakdowns uh some people attribute both of them to like syphilis they had syphilis that then turned into something worse yes um which was interesting but he was three years old when his dad had a mental breakdown and passed away in a sanatorium and then 20 years later his mother passed away or 20 or 10 years later his mother passed away in the same institution which is crazy um and so then he became obsessed with weird things (laughs) because how do you cope with that as a kid um he was obsessed with fear the idea of fear and the fear he felt himself which is scary um and he basically took his own like agoraphobia and fear and put it into his writing and then explored the world through this like mixture of horror fiction and astronomy (laughs) which is Mm -hmm. so strange um the family was like rich but then experienced a financial decline obviously when family members started passing away or becoming ill um so he never graduated high school but he was a really affluent writer which is interesting Uh, But uh, not to sing this man's praises, because I do not think, (laughs) we don't think we should be, Um, he is incredibly xenophobic and racist and misogynistic. Um, And a lot of his writing is embedded with like these really not great racial tropes that he sees through the lens of like humans and others versus like different ethnicities and races, which Uh like once you start peeling those back, you're like, oh, boo, <laughs> no, wait, that's just the same stuff. <laughs> right. Ew, we hate it. Um, but how he gained uh, popularity, which I didn't know, which maybe that's because I just know about Lovecraftian horror through um, Stranger Things. <laughs> but Pulp Fiction, which were like these little magazines. Uh, mm. that were coming out in the 1930s mm-hmm. uh, were really big in like geek culture so that was kind of how subcultures would kind of find popularity before the internet was through these zines um, and so he started writing for them and he started writing in this new umbrella of fiction called weird fiction which was coined later by him with a capital W which honestly fair um and so I was like, hey, what what kind of things were, like, being written in these things? So it was mostly horror, science fiction, and fantasy writings were being put out in these pulp fiction scenes. Mm-hmm. Uh, things like Conan the Barbarian, Tarzan, Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, and Perry Mason were all characters who first appeared through these magazines that then went on to get more things, which was cool. Oh. Um, so then he got really big, like, not only as a writer, but a, like, con- writer for these zine communities but also like uh consumer like he was reading a lot and and writing a lot the most popular one uh was called weird tales which was the one he was mostly published in and it was all of his short stories were published in this zine um and he 
basically this is what like i didn't know about this which it makes total sense when you know this so basically hp they call him extremely generous in this article because he mentored and motivated people to share and share alike all of his property so he would write these short stories in these worlds and tell people go forth and use them um like you have free reign to write fan fiction to write works including all of my lore um because his lore was so big so like that is what Uh... the root of why he is so well saturated is because he was like go for it and he had such clear uh and like weirdly specific and detailed like creatures and like whatever that people were like great these are like the stepping stones lore that we then build on mm. to create the monsters um which is it, it, i mean it's interesting like it's the whole argument of like what is what is intellectual property what is yours what is truly like original work yeah uh, which is so interesting but um basically like so many people have lovecraftian influences in their writing uh, because of that open market kind of thing okay um so then he died in 1937 at the age of 46 just before world war ii uh oh. he died very poor and, and very uh, young and very young he died very young and he um got influence and, and success kind of after he had passed away like i said before um so he didn't invent the genre of weird fiction it's very clear to say that but he did coin the term and he did really popularize it okay. so other people obviously have been writing like cosmos otherworldly extraterrestrial mm. uh it's not even extraterrestrial as much as it's like other dimensional it's weird mm. i don't honestly i tried i tried <laughs> i don't get a lot of it uh it's interesting and if someone could explain it to me using like American Girl dolls. I think I would get it, but <laughs> not in this context. Yeah. Um. But these are basically so. This article talks about um some of these like supernatural elements, natural and unnatural, that are really prevalent in Lovecraftian horrors that you might recognize as troops that have kind of like bled out of it. Mm. So this is what they say. Um. All the writers tended to play with the idea that unnatural or supernatural elements, perhaps even the entire world, lurk just beyond outside civilization, often adjacent or right next door to it. Their unassuming characters often stumbled into or encountered these worlds and supernatural forces by accident. Lovecraft, working within the tradition of fiction of borrowing from and remixing other stories, often directly borrowed story elements from his own fellow writers. So he talks about how he like uh would like take like biblical references or like different unholy notable monsters from other people and put them into his works as well Mm -hmm. um he became known for gravely serious detail rich descriptions of untold eldritch horrors Mm. which is his big broad monster category often blended with existential wonder these descriptions nearly always included his fictional characters confronting the idea of cold, different, and perhaps even actively hostile cosmic universe. So human humanity coming up against something that is other, be it that they're like aliens or whatever, or like creatures from space. Mm-hmm. Um, and like that us and them, which obviously you can see how that is deeply rooted. hmm is some racism um so this is like his big race (laughs) the big kind of monsters that he does they're called elder gods or great old ones okay um and they there's basically this one monster that everybody knows which i honestly didn't know his name's cthulhu you heard of him (laughs) no he's like a big have you ever seen the the church of the flying spaghetti monster nope okay well <laughs> then you this reference will be lost in you it looks like the the flying spaghetti monster guy okay um which is like a big ball of spaghetti in the sky that's what he looks like i mean you could have guessed that from context clues but yeah um <laughs> um 
So this guy, and I'll talk a little bit about what this guy looks like in a second, but Cthulhu's were basically able to infiltrate the mind and drive you mad through constant powerful summons to join him in his dark lair. So that like mind talk, think Vecna, think um, anything that like I am communicating with you and trying to turn you to the dark side, dark side, Mm. um, is that. Um, so he goes, uh, actually does have a call to followers who are devoted to helping him rise. No, duh, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and then he talks about how Lovecraft characters are often doomed travelers or explorers who make dark treks across the earth or even just New England to find a lost city or to find and read a forbidden book. Mm. So, one of the f- so you'll know this hopefully and my only reference was because i've seen evil dead the musical so many times but the necronomicon the book of the dead was an invention of hp lovecraft which is like the book from the evil dead it's called the necronomicon um which was borrowed from him and him and his lore but it's basically this book that summons demons from hell okay and like scary stuff and it's made of like human flesh it's kind of spooky looking sure um yeah and the evil dead the musical they sing a song about it and i was like oh my god yeah (laughs) i know this my context is weird that i know it but i do know of this um (laughs) but yeah it's strange but think like even part of me was like i wonder if that influenced the guy who wrote wicked when she has her spell like is it any spell Mm. rock is it whatever, whatever like so much i'm like man this is and it's like, I don't even know if he did it first, but he definitely did it the most popular. <laughs> so right. I think a lot of people pull from him. Um, but so this is what, <laughs> this is a little excerpt of what Cthulhu looks like from one of his uh, short stories. Okay. And you can get a taste of what his writing was like, which sounds like something I never want to read in my entire life. They were not composed altogether of flesh and blood. They had shape, but not shape was not but that shape was not made of matter when the stars were right they could plunge from world to world to the sky and when the stars were wrong they could not live but although they capital they no longer lived they would never really die they all lay in stone houses in their great city of really Preserved by the spells of the mighty, oh, I can't say it, Cthulhu, for a glorious resurrection when the stars and the earth might once be ready for them. So, like, uh huh, like religious imagery almost of like them. Interesting, interesting, um, yeah. interesting. And so, that is Cthulhu being one of the old ones, which is like these ancient beings, beings. that are around since the beginning of time that have infiltrated earth basically and live among Mm. us it's Mm -hmm. scary like it's it's like did i go on down a spiral for a couple weeks yeah it's giving hercules oh the um the titans seeing the titans interesting um yeah with like a bit of sci-fi mixed in like a little bit more like yeah i won't say technology but like a little bit more like mind communication yeah right. very much that um yeah and basically <laughs> it's this thing that can mold dreams um and the way that he describes it is <laughs> the weirdest thing um yeah he just if you look him up he looks like the flying spaghetti monster mm-hmm. um which is crazy okay so nearly all encounters with cosmic terror end up with love narrators going mad and fearing they'll go mad, or worse of all, realizing that they themselves have somehow directly related to the monster they're afraid of, or simply becoming the monster themselves. So a big theme in his work was like, these people learn something that they should not know, and humans are not capable of knowing, and then they go mad because of it. They learn some truth about these other beings, they learn some uh, secret of the universe that like humans cannot comprehend and then they go crazy 
which is terrifying. <laughs> I was like, that, yeah. that's scary enough, let alone flying spaghetti monster guy. Kind of spooky. Um, and so then the monster is me trope kind of comes from him as well. Of like, I am the bad guy. Which is crazy. Because uh, that's in so much. <laughs> um, yeah. So then, uh, so this was a Vox article. Uh, and it, actually, there was like quite a few really good articles because what comes alongside this was uh, a lot of people talking about Lovecraft again because that TV show, which was based on a book, came out called Lovecraft Country. Okay. It was basically this author wrote it. Like, what what would H.P. Lovecraft's universe look like set with Black protagonists? Okay. Um, set in Jim Crow era. And the show has its issues like I don't even want to open it I haven't seen it but from what I've read it's got issues Mm. Uh, but it definitely like was the tipping point for a lot of people to look at HP's work and be like hey how can I use this but use it critically and critique using it which I think Mm -hmm. is super interesting um but uh that's that's a little bit earlier in the thing I I just got excited um so (laughs) in this article there was this because I was like is this is the quote Hitler or Lovecraft? And I was like, oh no, I didn't even click it. I was like, if that is even a thing, it wasn't good. What this oh, was saying. No. It wasn't good what this dude was saying. Um, there was a lot of like, yeah, just a lot of xenophobia and a lot of racism for <sighs> both, like just a lot of hate of like immigrants, a lot of hate of everybody that was not a white man. Sure. In case you were wondering, HP Lovecraft was a white man um Checks out. and he was really scared about this idea of basically like two different species creating offspring and like obviously that's a really racist um, Eugen- it's eugenics <laughs> it's eugenics uh, and that's a big theme in a lot of his books is that but it's it's eugenics at the end of the day Ugh. um so a lot of people <laughs> have come to hp lovecraft events because i think a lot of horror friends see good in his work but it's like it's hard not to see the bad and it's yeah problematic not to see the bad um and people are like it was the time like you know he's 1890 guy born whatever and literally someone who wrote his biography or whatever memoirs was like no considering the era that this dude was born in in the time he grew up, he was incredibly racist. Like, he was way, way, way more racist than he should have been. And I was like, okay, slay. Kind of nice to know that. Because uh, I feel like a lot of people are like, it's just a product of its time. I'm like, no, it's no. not really a product of its time. But this is uh, a kind of an interesting little tidbit. So um, there is this award called the World Fantasy Award. Okay. And it was founded in 1975 uh, by a black writer named Meidi Okafora who won the first like honor of it okay um no that's a lie so that's so in 2011 they were the first black author to win the honor that's what I mean to say gotcha but the award is a bust of H.P. Lovecraft it's just literally his head and like it is first of all the ugliest thing I've ever seen it is like google it tonight it's ugly it looks like a looks like a wallace and gromit version of this guy's head it's bad it's bad Uh, (laughs) i love um, that imagery (laughs) but it gives you when when you see it you're gonna be like okay it is um and so she this author won this award and was like i don't want it like i don't want this bus it's like this sucks uh and so she wrote this blog post after basically talking about how her the greatest honor of her life was tarnished because it was a statue out of this really racist man and i was like not good okay little girl not good come here um and then in 2014 another uh writer petitioned to have it changed Mm. to maybe a bust of octavia butler and in the same year another black writer sophia simatar won and she said in her acceptance speech, which I thought was a big win, I can't sit down without addressing the elephant in the room, which is the controversy surrounding the image that represents this award. So she called it out in her speech and I said, nice. Yes. So in 2015, they retired his image. Good. And, um, 
basically people got really upset that they retired the image and then a lot of people were like why did it take you so long the classic yeah conversations whatever whatever um and now it started this like kind of like second wave of his works where people are looking at his works really critically Mm. and like there's this um like a recurring panel that was named after Lovecraft's fictional university called uh, Shadow Over Lovecraft, where they talk about the things innately in his work that are not okay and mm-hmm. how to look at it through a critical lens and how to see the racism. Like, I was like, this is really interesting because it's using something that is very accessible and it's very infiltrated in our society. Yeah. But talking about what's wrong with it and talking about, like, I'm like, this is very, this is like a cool second life of this. Yeah. Thing, which I thought was cool. Um, and this is a quote from author Matt, Matt Ruff. Uh, he says, in giving vent to his bigotry, he taps into a larger fear that I think we all have as people who are different from us and mean us no good, he says. It's one of the reasons you can take his stories and repurpose them. He may not have realized universal universalism. Universal- universalism? Yeah. <laughs> of some of what he was writing about but I can take that away from his work was like mm-hmm. these themes we were talking about were really big and they have merit to them in some cases but you need to take right. them away from their racist roots um so then this HBO Lovecraft Country comes out people are talking about it right and then it kind of spurs this like third wave of black horror authors using Lovecraftian tropes mm-hmm. and monsters in creating black horror which i think is just freaking cool um so there's an author called victor lavelle um who says he's so woven in i think of horror as a whole and i can feel it in me a a little bit like removing an arm like not using lovecraftian stuff Mm. but and so instead i feel like an alternative choice is to identify the illness and maybe we can save the arm and i was like Mm. kind of snake um and so there's a book, actually, a book talk, Sweetheart, that huh. uh, is kind of a repurposed Lovecraftian thing. Uh, and it's Mexican Gothic by oh. Sophia Lillian Garcia. Which um, was just featured on Canada Reads. Sure was. Um, but this book is basically like a POC look of Lovecraftian and Lovecraftian horror and kind of turning it on its head a little bit which I was like okay big oh. slay kind of cool um that because for me like I didn't know it was Lovecraftian no one ever talks about that but it's yeah I guess not something you know you notice until you start noticing if that makes sense right um yeah and then it, it like there's this quote from another author um and the author's name is what is his name it's still the same guy yes it is still the same guy Lavelle so he wrote a book called The Ballad of Black Tom which was award-winning uh, and it revolves around the premise that much of Lovecraft's horror is predicted on ridiculous white privilege which it is all mm. of its protagonists are white whatever whatever that horrific realization that all of Lovecraft's characters undergo that the universe doesn't revolve around them that's not a problem any black character would ever have so then he says If you're Black, he said, you don't think that the universe as a whole thinks you are wonderful because all you have to do, all you have to do, because all you have to do, if you're Black, he said, (laughs) you don't think the the universe as a whole thinks you are as wonder, you are wonderful because all you have to do is be you. If you're a Black American, all you have to do is walk through America and this country teaches you. The idea that you would be driven mad because you found out that the universe doesn't think you're special is a joke to me as a Black American, Mm. uh, which is very interesting. Um, And basically, he goes on to say, this series is being adapted into a TV series uh, by AMC, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, He also points out stories like Get Out and HBO's Watchmen as signs that Black modern creators are successful subverting many of the racist tropes to fuel the generation of new media um 
And Jean Ray said is the pleasant, pleasant casing that makes the medicine go down, okay. which is using horror as this boat to question and to conflict with these this history legacy of racism which i thought was so freaking interesting yeah um and then this is just the last little bit of the article which i thought was a nice sum up so i'll just read it verbatim perhaps that means the universality of lovecraft's themes can also serve as a fundamental appeal that allows modern horror writers to subvert and ultimately transform his tropes into smart aware commentaries that are very on the very kind of racism he invited. And that perhaps is the biggest Lovecraftian twist of all. The unknown cosmic terror transformed into something as familiar and toddy, tawdry as everyday racism, and then vanquished into the light of understanding in favor of new and better stories. Mm. So that is this whole notion of H.P. Lovecraft in his short stories and how his lore kind of seeped into the genre of horror and changed it for forever, but now how authors are taking this racist legacy and turning it on its head and using it as a way to make commentary on it which i was like oh so freaking cool yeah like, that is the horrors of hp lovecraft That's it's a cool. very interesting way to approach like you can't separate the art from the artist like and they're not they are looking at dead in the face and being like yes. we're, we're not even going to try and separate it so how can we continue to use it and utilize it in a way that looks at looks at it at face value and manipulates so it. So interesting. Because it's like, I love that quote from the author when he's like, being a Black American, this would never happen. Like having the idea this right. whole world revolves around me and that I'm the most important person in the universe. Uh, and like how this horror genre and like much of everything was so catered to one specific kind of ethnicity mm-hmm. that to broaden that up and to open it and to see things from different perspectives just makes it cooler and just makes it richer and just makes it deeper and just makes it more meaningful so I just thought it was like this weird conversation I was having with my friend in the car yeah (laughs) that spurred into this really cool deep dive onto this not great cool dude but people who are doing cool things with this stuff that's really cool yeah, because I that was definitely long. heard of H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, like Lovecraftian, people throw it around. I, and I was like, I've never read any of his stuff, to be me honest neither. with you. And like, th- there's a lot of, like the thing, like the horror movie, the thing is Lovecraft. Cabin in the Wood has a lot of Lovecraftian. Horror, Stranger Things has Lovecraft. True Detective, X-Files, like a lot of like big sci-fi fantasy stuff have right. Lovecraft things in it. Mm. Um. And honestly, probably a lot. Like, you could probably draw lines from pretty much everything. Yeah. So it's very interesting. Well done. Thanks. That was great. Thanks. I feel like I learned something. I feel like 2023 is the year that I'm like, let's talk about racist authors. <laughs> That's been my theme, which ding, is kind, ding, of, ding. kind of interesting. All right. Well, Walnut's going to cuddle in. Okay. And then... uh we're ready yeah um I have a lead in to mine as well just (gasps) because I initially was going to talk about the current attempt at to defund the New York Public Library um and while that's not what I'm talking about I do think it's important to mention because we do have plans to do a book banning episode there's just we do so many weeds so many weeds to go through I think we're probably going to specifically focus on the united states yeah and there's no way we can talk about more than just one country um with everything going on in the u.s right now but i especially because that's not what i decided to talk about i think it is worth mentioning um that there is a lot of libraries that are getting defunded um there was a movement to potentially shut down a library branch in texas because the book ban that they tried to input was uh, struck down. And so mm-hmm. to combat that, they're like, well, we're just going to shut down the branch. Um, so, you know, look into what's happening at your local library. Call your representatives. Let them know that uh, we do they're not appreciate job. them taking away resources from communities because getting books from libraries is not the only thing that people use libraries for. And call librarians and tell them they're doing a good job. Mm-hmm. If they're doing a good job. 
you know they appreciate it yes but uh i am talking about the hoax (gasps) that became a book (gasps) hoax (laughs) because i was like i was gonna talk about something super serious and then i was like i don't want to talk about something funny yeah um so do you think it's possible to get a book so talked about it makes a bestseller list without anyone having read it or for that matter publishing it yeah any Colleen Hoover book you could not you could convince me they're not real (laughs) um so we're gonna take a trip back to the 1950s oh when Colleen Hoover was born yeah and we're gonna talk about I Libertine the fake book that became real I Libertine yes oh I've never heard of this this is so interesting I'm excited um I have a little a little quote in here there's no question that we are a tiny, tiny, embattled minority here. Hardly anyone is listening to mankind in all of its silliness, all of its idiocy, all of its trivia, all of its wonder, all of its glory, all of its poor, sad, pitching us into the dark sea of oblivion. John Whoa. Shepard or Jean Shepard. Who was Jean Shepard? As Time Magazine wrote an article about him, he was resolutely non-political on WR. WOR, a New York radio station on which he broadcast from 1956 to 1977. He offered mock commentary on cultural trends, social behavior, and the favorite pastimes of night people, a term he used frequently, if not exclusively, to refer to his listeners. Uh, quote, slobs. Night people. <laughs> night people. Uh, slobs, a term he used to mean common folk. And oh, okay. Fat heads, um, which essentially was an insult, meaning those who don't get it, but used in a positive sense when used to greet his listeners, uh, which he used the phrase excelsior, you fat heads. Just to give you a little taste of this person. He sounds like the friend in the friend group that like no one really knows why they're friends with him. They're like, why why do we keep John around, man? Yeah. Um Today, Shepard is probably most known for contributing to writing and narrating a Christmas story. The collections oh. In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash, and Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories all contributed to the story of Ralphie, or so the articles say I've never actually seen it. Okay. Um, it's on my list of Christmas movies to watch, but I've never seen it. Um, these Have you written- seen the musical? nope mm. uh these written stories which we'll come back to that december. The movie. <laughs> we'll come back to that in december <laughs> we'll circle back yeah uh i got what nine months don't say that it's less than that no, i can't i can't keep going so, <laughs> uh, so these written stories which would come to inspire the movie all came from tales told on shepherd's radio show by the mid-1960s, Shepard began adapting his autobiographical monologues into stories initially for Playboy magazine and then for his books. The plot of A Christmas Story was assembled from pieces of a half dozen different stories. But now, back to the hoax and the reason we are here. Mm. So, we're going to look at this term night people, which you laughed at because it's funny. Um, Shepard's show aired in the wee hours of the morning around okay. 12 to 5 a.m. Uh, and as his show progressed, Shepard developed a deeply devoted following. Um, people would call in with comments of their own, and his listeners enjoyed a sense of belonging to the secret, close-knit community that existed on the margins of normal society, because it was between 12 and 5 in the morning. Uh, Shepard called his listeners the night people, and they even had their own password, Excelsior, with which they could identify each other out in public. The appropriate response, if someone said Excelsior to you, was seltzer bottle. Uh, He said night people were more creative because night is the time people truly become individuals because all the familiar things are dark and done, all the restrictions on freedom are removed. So the opposite Mm. of night people are day people. And day people, (laughs) obviously, day people are bound by rules, lists, and schedules. They were, he said, the victims of creeping meatballism uh, and the inventors of red tape. And so they were just, like, super organized, like, too meticulous and, like, um, not as creatively, like, free-flowing as night people. 
So this is like where the root of this hoax comes from is this like divide between day and night okay. people. So one day in um early April of 1956, Can I ask makes... you a question? Yeah. Are you a day person or a night person? I don't know. Like I love a list. Come comment down below if you think Deirdre or not. What do you think we are? I think you're a night person. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> Cut to me like asleep at seven, but I. I also the, just think the prim- principle of night person. But I I'm also like, just think the two of us are in like really weird spots in our lives where our like legitimate schedules dictate the type of people that we are oh very much that very much that you know i just feel like i have such a clear like night people for me are like trench coat up <laughs> sunglasses on briefcase like spies. <laughs> and then day people are like i don't know why i think this they're like sickly pale people <laughs> who like go out in the sun and loop. i don't know i feel like i have the wrong image of these people um that's, I think we're both night people, but I think just because I think they're the cool guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, keep going. I'm sorry. It's okay. it's, it's an interesting uh, way to classify guess. people. Yeah. Um. So one day in early April of 1956, Shepard makes his way into a bookstore, and it was during the daytime, obviously, because that's when the store is open. Uh, and he was forced to interact with a day person uh so oh, no one article and then also uh that was like a recap but then also i was able to read a wall street journal article or washington mm. i think um from 1956 Whoa. uh yeah that said that he was asking the bookseller for the script of the old radio serial vic and sade and uh he asked for help finding the book and the bookseller consulted like a list of published books and the shelves, but couldn't find the book that he was looking for. And the bookseller said that not only did they have it not to sell, but the book couldn't exist at all because it didn't appear in any of these publishers lists. Like oh. he, he'd never heard of it. He couldn't find it in this like organization system that they had at this specific bookstore. So, you know, obviously the conclusion is that this book doesn't exist at all um and for Shepard this encounter was a stark reminder of the difference between day and night people because the day person which is the bookseller was so beholden to their list that there was no realm of possibility where Shepard's book that they were searching for existed you look like you're about to say something no 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 I'm just listening and I feel like for some reason, like, this is a Lovecraftian story. There's something going on here, but my brain's still stuck on the last thing. This is so interesting. So then after this encounter, he's on the radio talking to his listeners, and he says, excuse me, he asked, has it occurred to you that these lists are compiled by mortals and that they are human just like you are? And in fact, they have many more axes to grind than you. So okay. when he, like, thinks about how bookseller lists get made he described the little guy working at the newspaper bored because for four years he was on obituaries and all the big (laughs) dreams of one day becoming a star reporter are for naught and now Shepard said he's at this desk and all he does every Monday is call these little schluck book dealers around town and says well what's selling this week madam in their turn, the booksellers would have their own agenda, like the buyer who bought 500 copies of Who Shot John three months ago, mm-hmm. and he's got 497 of them now. So why Who Shot John is moving here, I'll tell you, there's nothing like it. Um, all it would take, Shepard pointed out, is for a few others to say the same thing, and the book would make the bestseller list, and all the people who believe in lists would rush out like mad and buy it. So... You know, we've had many conversations about the way bookseller lists kind of work. And yep. yes, now there se- seems to be sometimes a little bit of actual data that goes into it rather than just like taking people's words for Word it. Mouth. Yeah. But um, there is kind of like a point to this, you know, like what makes a bestseller? A lot of times it is word of mouth. Yeah. Um, And so... 
as he was sharing these thoughts, a practical joke occurred to him. He's all the night people he suggested should descend on bookstores en masse and request a book that truly didn't exist. The day people would be, or the day people would be driven mad searching for this non-existent book. It would shake their faith in their lists. He wanted to get a book talked about so much that it made the bestseller list and he wanted it to be a non-existent book. He said, quote, what better way to restore the status quo than to shake the day people's faith in their organization? And what better place to start than the, with bookshop clerks whose lists make them the most organized of all? Um, and, you know, I've worked in retail. I'm not out here <laughs> to, like, target <laughs> any retail workers who are just trying to make ends meet and, like, pay, their, pay bills. their bills. But at the same time, like, they are part of this larger food chain that yeah. I think he is attacking more so than the individual booksellers, the considering just the one of them pissed him off. That's <laughs> the vendetta this man has against Right. Us. So then his <laughs> listeners really embraced his plan. Mm -hmm. And so the book they decided to talk about was I Libertine. It was going to be written by an 18th century erotica expert named Frederick R. Ewing. This snowballed so much that they created a biography for this non-existent author. He was to have been an Oxford graduate, a okay. retired Royal Navy commander and a scholar, married to a horsewoman from the North Country, and well-remembered for his series of BBC talks on erotica of the 18th century. I, Libertine was perfect in its blend of highbrow and salaciousness. It was to be the first volume of a trilogy on 18th century English court life. In a quote from Shepard, Mr. Ewing is quite surprised at the success his book is enjoying since it was written primarily for scholars, people who won't misunderstand that certain chapters are there for the purpose of scholarly research. I, Libertine would be issued by Excelsior Press, an imprint of Cambridge University Press. Cambridge gave it the stamp of officialdom while Excelsior worked as a sort of secret handshake. Failure mm. to recognize the shepherd battle cry would be an immediate sign that whoever they were talking to wasn't a fellow night person. Mm. So they cook up this idea. And then according to reports, the day after Shepard first proposed the idea, 27 requests were placed at the Fifth Avenue bookstore for I Libertine. I'm, I think this was in New York. Um, okay. And in the following weeks, Shepard's fans made their way to bookstores throughout the United States to order the book. One of his listeners was a steward on the Queen Mary and placed requests for it in stores in England and Scandinavia. Reports no. say that the book would go on to have hundreds of requests, not only in New York, but across the globe, thanks to the myriad of jobs night people had, like being pilots and flight attendants. Dang. Other <laughs> yeah. Other reports say that some listeners went so far as to create fake library cards, and I don't think they mean like personal library cards to check out books i think yeah back in the day they had the library cards to request books gotcha, gotcha you know what gotcha, i mean gotcha. um yes. and they snuck them into the card catalogs at libraries so Slay. we're going way back <laughs> um one report even said that a student had written a book report on i libertine earning a b plus with a signature of excelsior from the professor at the bottom of the paper upon return to the student that's so that was in two funny. articles that I read. I love that. <laughs> so, <is> so fun. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I'm having fun. Right? So the original goal, put an imaginary book on the bookseller list, went by the wayside as Shepard ceased to have control over I Libertine's direction, though he would later claim the book did land on a few bestseller lists. No evidence of this has yet surfaced. According to one of the websites I went through, for Shepard, the low point came when I Libertine was banned in Boston. It was given this honor because a listener who worked for the Archdiocese put I Libertine on its infamous proscribed list as a goof, as Berkman describes. Uh, <laughs> once the book was on the list, though, no one dared remove it. Uh, and Shepard says, next thing I know, the president's going to mention it. And then I wouldn't believe in anything. Um, and then a couple of the articles were kind of talking about his discussion sometimes verged into like ph philosophical talking and like just like 
rambling between playing music um yeah and it's kind of like if we said on this podcast like uh, a book title that didn't exist and then all of a sudden it like blows up on book talk and everybody's talking about how you have to go read this book like yeah it suddenly loses all meaning because now everybody's talking about it <gasps> and like it doesn't it's not like exactly <laughs> exactly so bookstore owners didn't know what to make <laughs> of the multiple <laughs> requests for i libertine obviously they contacted publishers to inquire when this novel that everyone was talking about would be released. Um, and in this way, word of the book eventually made its way to the publisher Ian Ballantyne by the end of April 1956. So okay. it took like about a month for things to kind of settle. That's still really impressive. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and so Ian Ballantyne traced it back to Shepard. Uh, Ballantyne thought it would be an interesting idea to capitalize on the hoax by actually publishing the book for real. So Shepard agreed to this idea, and science fiction writer Theodore Sturgeon, who would go on to write several episodes of Star Trek, uh, oh. who was also a fan of Shepard, was commissioned to write the text. It is said that Sturgeon wrote the novel in 30 days, uh, and it would be based on the adventures of an 18th century it's English... <laughs> It was going to be based on the adventures of an 18th century English duchess to be released on September 20th, 1956, with a print run of 130,000 copies. <laughs> Shepard posed as Frederick Ewing for the author photo on the back cover, and in a postscript, special thanks were given to the night people, quote, whose battle cry is excelsior and whose humor and forbearance are really responsible for the work. The hoax had been revealed like a month-ish before publication date in an article written for the Wall Street Journal, which is the one I read. Um, yeah. And the resulting publicity helped sales, even though reviews of the novel itself were generally lukewarm. One reviewer wrote, quote, despite a couple of ingenious twists, there is one spot where the novel almost comes to a halt and the loving is pretty sleazy. <laughs> <laughs> another Ooh. said quote throughout the characters are depicted in a manner that suggests at times that they might have descended not from english nobility but from contemporary spacemen <laughs> uh copies of the book are now considered collector's items so Ooh. i don't know that the hoax books ever actually made it onto a list but it did cause enough of a stir to become an actualized project which now lives on in literary history that is so freaking cool right how petty like we love the pettiness of it all. i know i love that i love the fact that it's like this subculture niche of people who like walk around they're like excelsior and then the person doesn't <laughs> respond and then they go i would like to order a copy of i libertine please <laughs> like what did i could just like <laughs> And again, I'm picturing people like black trench coat, briefcase, just walking in with sunglasses. Um, <laughs> Excelsior. It feels, for some reason, it gives very much like Milady vibes. With yeah. Like uh, but man, this is fun. What a cool story. Wasn't Great job. Fun? Thank you. I just stumbled across it. And I was like, wow, I have never heard of this. I've never heard of it either. Excelsior seems familiar. Is that from something else? it's stupid? used in marvel okay i thought it was a maybe King arthur or some i feel like there's some like are you thinking of excalibur <laughs> who knows i'm sure I'm it Google is it. yeah i mean it's a phrase that's i'm sure i'm thinking again. of excalibur <laughs> <I'm sure I'm laughs> right. um because you said that and i was like maybe i have her because that that seems so familiar to me that i was like but that was the only part that seemed familiar like i know uh, it from marvel but i also know that it's probably in other things as well um i know no it just seems to be from like stanley from the marvel comics yeah maybe that's maybe i don't know interesting i've learned lots this is so cool what a cool <laughs> little thing what a fun episode everyone clap, have clap. fun have fun snoozing tonight unite people yeah right <laughs> dream of lovecraftian horror and uh, a sweet pettiness
I'll dream of sweet pettiness. I won't be dreaming of horror, please God. But definitely go check out that the the World Fantasy Awards <laughs> statue. Oh, that, yes, that, that I will look up. That is funny. Um, that is funny. Okay, well, I hope I feel like this was a very informative episode, right? Uh, and, and like, I kind of like that we both went very history with it. <laughs> We were like, this is what the break gave us. The break gave us this ability to like do something kind of funky. Yeah. Uh, Hey, kind of fun. Okay, what what are we reading? What are you reading? So I finished two books over the last few days uh, that I would like to talk about. Cool kid makes up. The first is Sword Heart by T. Kingfisher. And okay, yeah, she has become one of my favorite fantasy authors. I know when I step into a T. Kingfisher fantasy world, I'm going to be swept away. There's going to be talking things that I'm not expecting to talk. And it's there's probably going to be like funny, quippy romance. It's not yeah. going to be very spicy, but I'm going to have a lot of fun reading it. So Sword Heart is a standalone inside the world of Clockwork Boys. So there's a duology of Clockwork Boys, The Standalone of Sword Heart, and then the Saint of Steel series, which I have been reading and talking about. Um, cool. Which is like Paladin's Grace, Paladin's Strength, yeah. and Paladin's Hope. Cool. Um, so I'm kind of reading this whole world backwards, uh, which I didn't realize I was doing, because you can, in theory, read it in any order that you want. Um, yeah. They, it just like, I think some things may have made more sense if I'd read them in publication order but um so in Sword Heart we meet this woman named Hala who is a widow and after her husband died she started to take care of her dead husband's uncle Silas and so she'd been living with him as his housekeeper just helping helping him with his daily tasks and like managing his household Silas dies and leaves everything to Hala and so at the beginning of the book we are at the the post will reading situation where Silas's blood relatives are absolutely beside themselves that this woman who married into their family whose husband is no longer alive was given everything he owned like land money possessions everything no blood relatives were given anything honestly good for her and so her she keeps calling her aunt malva which is her dead husband's aunt is trying to get her to marry her son which is her dead husband's cousin (laughs) and because (laughs) hala is like no i don't want to do that they end up holding her hostage in her own bedroom and locking her in there for three days <gasps> and she's finally like i gotta get out of here like i she's like i can't marry this person he's got clammy no. hands and this is i can't do it and <laughs> she, she thinks she's going to kill herself that this is the only way no. out and she realizes that there is a sword above her bed and so she pulls the sword down and she's trying to figure out like oh she's like they say that like soldiers fall on their swords but like how would how do they do that (laughs) yeah she's trying to figure it out and so she unsheaths the sword and out comes very genie like this man (gasps) and he is like the servant of the sword and whoever wields the sword he is the protector of and his name is silas he doesn't know how long he's been in the sword he uh like she only knows who her uncle bought the sword from and because it is now in her possession and she is the one that opened it she is the sword's wielder and he will protect her and so he is like we're gonna get you out of here and thus begins their adventure of getting out of the house trying to find some sort of aid to get her this will sorted and to get this family like off her back and they go on this like wild adventure there's landscapes that just move around at will (laughs) uh there's bandits there's sword fighting um 
there's like hijinks and all of these very, very funny tropes like shoved into this like kind of like mid to high stakes scenario. But the thing I really like about T. Kingfisher's writing is it feels cozy. So I think if you're a fan of cozy fantasy, even though it's a lot of like stabby stabby things are happening um the way it's packaged and delivered doesn't feel uh the way like an epic high fantasy does Ooh, that sounds cool uh it's a slow burn romance Mm -hmm. and it was so much fun like I had so much fun reading it it was (gasps) it was so fun I I loved it I I loved it um so it was the first book and then today I finished The Stand-In by Lily Chu. Yes. And this book was okay. Like yeah. I'm either reading books like Sword Heart where I could like talk for hours and hours and hours about how incredible they are. Or yeah. I'm reading books like The Stand-In where I'm like, it was good, but it like fumbled the ball at the end. Yeah. Um. So in The Stand-In, we meet Gracie who is in a job where she is being sexually harassed by her boss her mom has alzheimer's and dementia her dad is dead and oh my gosh, gracie <laughs> i know and she like doesn't have a lot of friends and she's trying to figure out like how to keep going and yeah. her main goal is to get her mom into a better care facility so she's like i have okay. to stay in this job because it's contributing to my savings which will eventually get my mom into a better home yeah and one day she's walking out and about she's getting a coffee and this photographer comes up and starts taking pictures of her and calling her by another name and she's like I don't know who you think I am but that sure ain't <laughs> it fast forward to a car pulling up and a Chinese actress uh basically being like i want to hire you to be my body double because we look so similar and she embarks on becoming this woman's body double where uh feng li can go to work she's been hired to do a play in toronto and she wants to like focus on the job it takes place in toronto um so she can do her job as the actress and then gracie will dress up as her and go out to events and dinners and just be seen in the toronto social circles with her co-star sam and uh it's it's fun like it's this very normal person whose mom was like don't stand out too much like just put your head down and and do your best and all this stuff and now she's like thrust into pretending to be this international movie star um and like (laughs) it's so it's it's like a very fun premise but I think where it kind of ends up falling apart is in the like the mom with the alzheimer's storyline yeah even the the boss that was sexually harassing her like that through line kind of crumbled a little bit in the end um i was expecting it to be even semi spicy and it was there was nothing there was it was it was it, it, it wasn't even fade to black <laughs> there was no there was nothing there was there was a like stuff happened and that's all we get <laughs> um and the, the tension and the like growth of the romance was a lot of fun but even that like third act breakup felt muddled in some ways um i would recommend it like i think it's a mm-hmm. great good book great book eh. um but i don't think it's like a super strong romance yeah or a super strong like contemporary plot there there but i couldn't put it down so well there you go okay miss girl <laughs> she's loving you today yeah i don't know 
maybe I'm giving off distressed hormones. I don't know, man. Um, that sounds really cool. It sounds, it gives like very parent trap vibes or like princess in the pauper vibes. Just yeah. I feel like it would be a really good movie. Like when you were describing it, I was like, I would watch this movie. I don't know if I'd read the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's like a there's a twist in the in the third exists. act that I did see coming a little bit, but it's are they twins? Kind of fun. No. Okay. So imagine if imagine uh. if I just spoiled the book. <laughs> um, I the thing I will say, and I would like to talk to somebody about this, is why why are so many contemporary romances having either the main character or the love interest? have a parent with alzheimer's or dementia Grey's anatomy because i'm over it it's, Grey's, it's I, the Grey's anatomy of all this thing's been going on for what 19 seasons i powered through that plot in this book because it's been because they sent it to me a year ago and it's been yeah. staring at me on my shelf and i was like i have to read this book like it, it's it 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 was like i couldn't move on before i read this book yeah and that I was like, like another one. I've DNF'd so many books since my Nana passed away because I'm like, I can't yeah. do it right now. Like, I don't know if I'll yeah. ever be able to really invest myself in a storyline where we've got an Alzheimer's dementia parent, which is why I'm glad I read Thank You for Listening before my grandma died. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's just like, because honestly like I ended up learning a lot about Alzheimer's in university and psychology courses which was really cool um and like my grandma also had dementia um so it was something that like I would learn and then I was able to be like oh this is this thing that like I have a, a, a lived experience of right but we are finding out way more about Alzheimer's than we ever have before now yeah so I feel like it's just it's this kind of weird thing where it's like because we have information readily more available when we are understanding what this disease is it is like the thing that everyone is putting into these books and it's like right it's it i yes because it seems like every tv show i watch somebody has alzheimer's or somebody has dementia and i'm like does everybody have this or is this just like this rain cloud that is following <laughs> certain yeah people around? and i'm like that's Look, what it feels like. i just want to read a rom-com yeah <laughs> where really no scene. parent no parent, no grandparent has Alzheimer's or dementia. And I don't know what I got to do to get it. See, this is why we need content warnings. Put a little dementia, Alzheimer's. Ding, 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 ding. I need okay. it right on the front page. Yeah. And if it's a if it's a spoiler, boo. Uh-uh. Boo. Not a spoiler. Um, So exciting. Glad you're reading. Love to see it. Um. I have been reading too, but all the books I've been reading have been pretty meh. Mm. Um, which is fine. I did a I have been rereading some books. I've been getting into Zoe Draven books, who is mm. like a Kindle Unlimited. I I she's a indie romance author, I should say. That is a that is the better way to put it, who writes a lot of like alien romances, mm. which I think are pretty fun. Um, Lillian. Oh gosh, is that who it is? I think it is Lillian Lark. She writes more mutuals on TikTok. Yeah, it's a whole thing. Um, but she recommended this, and I was like, "Okay, I'll go check out this author." And I really did like her series, and like they're all intermingled. Like it's very, it gives Ice Planet Barbarian vibes in the way that like the series is so big and it just branches off. Right. Each series has about three books, three or four, but there's a bigger universe that they're all part of, which is kind of fun. Mm. Uh, it's fine. Like they're, um, what's nice about them is like a little bit of meat to the bones of it, which is mm. nice. Um, and the women protagonists aren't super, um which i like sure. um i also read the gargoyles captive which is the third book in a deal with the demon series by katie robert mm -hmm. she's giving Thoughts. mid i didn't love it and i didn't love 
I didn't the like Kraken the Kraken one. book. This one was like, I don't know, because like the first book I really liked. Same. And then it just feels like we haven't gone back to the cozy that that first book gave. Right. And it might just be because like there is this book specifically is like enemies. Like she is a monster hunter. She's come to this world to revenge her mother. And he's like needs to have a baby basically. So it's like it just never seems like they genuinely like each other. Mm. I mean they get to a point where they do but like I was like meh and they're so short that I'm like they just go so fast and I'm like yeah that was my biggest critique of Dragon's Bride was I wish if it hadn't been longer that it at least took place over a longer period of time agreed uh agreed uh very much that but all that being said uh, I am rereading for a third time so far this year, The Anthropocene Reviewed, because I nice. literally can't stop thinking about that book. But I pulled some quotes that this is my this is my campaign to get you all to read this book. Uh, again, I have to highly recommend that you listen to the audiobook. I played it in the car <laughs> on the road trip after we talked about Lovecraft. Yeah. Um, and people did fall asleep. So he does have a temper of like, it doesn't put me to sleep. It's just like, really- relaxes me I love the way he talks yeah um anyway uh here are some some quotes so there's a chapter that he talks about uh academic decathlon which is so funny that he went to a boarding school in 10th grade where there was a students b students and c students who are on these athletic or academic decathlon students so they you couldn't just have like a whole bunch of a students you had to have different uh a variety of students so he was a c student and so he talks about how he gave a speech at nationals about rivers. And this is a part uh, of this little speech. He goes, or uh, it's not, it's like a reflection on the speech after he goes, rivers keep going and we keep going. And there's no way back to the roof of that hotel, but the memory still holds me together, which I was like, okay, ouchie, it hurts my feelings. So beautiful. Yeah. Another one. Um, humans are not the protagonists of this planet's story. If there is a main character, it's life itself, which makes which makes of Earth and starlight something more than Earth and starlight. But in the age of the Anthropocene, humans tend to believe, despite all available evidence, that the world is here for our benefit. Mm. Okay, you guys, I'm trying to read something. Um, human, or no, history, like human life, is at once incredibly fast and agonizingly slow. Um... I reread the work of my friend and mentor, Amy Kroos Rosenthal, who died a few months earlier. She'd once written, uh, for anyone trying to discern what to do with their life, pay attention to what you pay attention to. That's pretty much all the information you need. And I was like, oh my God. Mm. Okay, and then these are two longer ones. Oh my God, there's three. I'm so sorry. But they're, I, I'm trying to convince you here. Um <laughs> I feel very. I promise you, I do, I personally don't need convincing. I have I know. the audiobook, and I just need. To I start know. It. I I I just need every. I need. I I feel like I've. This is how people join cults. Like I feel so connected to this like parasocial relationship I have with John Green right now that I'm like, everybody needs to get in this cult with me. Um, <laughs> at the end of his life, the great picture book author and illustrator Maurice Sendak said on the NPR show Fresh Air, I cry a lot because I miss people. I cry a lot because they die and I can't stop them. They leave me and I love them more. He said, I'm finding out as I'm aging that I'm in love with the world. It has taken me all of my life up till now to fall in love with the world, but I've started to feel it in the last couple of years. To fall in love with the world isn't to ignore or overlook suffering both human and otherwise. But for me anyway, to fall in love with the world is to look up at the night sky and feel your mind swim before the beauty and the distance of the stars. It is to hold your child while they cry, to watch as sycamore trees leaf out in June, when your breastbone starts to hurt and your throat tightens and tears well in your eyes. I want to look away from that feeling. I want to deflect with irony or anything else that will keep me from feeling directly. We all love how endings, mm -mm, we all love, 
we all know how loving ends. But I want to fall in love with the world anyhow, to let it crack me open. I want to feel what there is to feel while I am here. Mm. Um, okay, I'm just going to skip to this last one. Um, so this, this is a chapter I just listened to, uh, because in case you don't know, John Green was going to go to divinity school. So he was going to be like a deacon or a priest. So he talks a lot about God. And the book was, this book was being written during COVID. So he talks about, he doesn't talk a lot about God. He talks about his own experience with religion and God, which I think is interesting. Yeah. Um, and he talks a lot about COVID. So those are two content warnings I will give. Uh, but I loved what he said here. Uh, people ask me all the time if I believe in God. I tell them I'm Episcopalian or that I go to church, but they don't care about that. They only want to know if I believe in God and I can't answer them because I don't know how to deal with the question in. Do I believe in God? Do I, I believe around God, but I can only believe in what I am in sunlight and shadow, oxygen and carbon dioxide, solar systems and galaxies. Mm. Like this man, it, like it is the most beautiful nonfiction book I've ever read. And it's so... I just love how everything, the way that he crafts this story is so freaking smart. He's such a freaking smart writer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just stays with you. Like, I'll listen. I I feel like I am in, like, my gratitude era where, like, I just feel so grateful to be where I am, to be alive, to, like, being able to talk with the people that I can talk with and just experience whatever. Yeah. Uh, and his book is so much about gratefulness and gratitude and just even though it hurts experiencing things because it's worth it oh I don't yeah. know it's just so good that's cool uh, it's such a freaking good book I just yeah you know, like it I haven't read a book since probably baritone or addy that have left me so like profoundly in love with the prose of it hmm. that like I read the book and I'm like these, these words are so meaningful even like outside mm-hmm. of the context of their actual meaning in this in the whatever right these lines are powerful um it feels like scripture it's crazy man i just mm. uh, read this book read this book you guys and if not i'm gonna have to keep rereading it <laughs> until you guys do it um it's so good it is so good i've heard nothing but good things about it it's so it's it's life-changing um in the most unpretentious way possible yeah it's so good Ugh. anyway that's it Love that's it. what i'm doing oh amazing we made it to the end of this episode our first one back from break which is so exciting uh if you liked this episode and want to stay connected with us and come back for more please be sure that you rate review and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and you subscribe to us on youtube you can like this video you can hit that notification bell and you should leave us a comment on our instagram at books on the brain people have been kind of i know they've been coming onto our comments on instagram and on youtube um and you should leave us uh the little nerd emoji excelsior excelsior bottle soda bottle i can't remember seltzer seltzer bottle i don't know um i think you should leave us or they could leave us the moon face (laughs) <laughs> depends on uh, yeah whichever 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 story is going to give you nightmares leave um them. or all of them all the emojis uh, <laughs> the other cat makes an appearance can't keep talking um, at the end hello um yes while you're on instagram you could follow us at uh books on the brain pod uh that is where you will get the most up-to-date information and after or before this episode aired we have been doing uh lives on instagram and on our personal tiktoks which we hope to continue doing so if you follow us on instagram you will be up to date on when those are happening you can also go ahead and follow us on our personal accounts i'm at deirdre rose morgan on instagram tiktok and youtube i'm at dj books on tiktok instagram and on pinterest follow me there And that is it for today's episode. We hope to chat to you in the next one.
Bye. Bye.